going to have academic training, a session or a series, which is going to have uh, four sessions. The first one starting today, which will be on a tier introduction. Uh, and then we will have some on two experimental sessions coming and again at the end some grand view on the theory and maybe beyond the standard model type of uh, discussions. So today we have the pleasure of having uh, Pilar Hernandez who will talk to us and give the, int the introduction. Uh, she's from Valencia as you see here but she's also actually at CERN right now and as a leader of this so-called new theory neutrino effort, so some effort that was build up here as well as there is an EP group effort that started last year. This is a theory counterpart and of course we work closely together with them. And um, I think you're going to be here still till the middle of this year, till summer or so, so any discussions on this thing can of course be followed up later. Okay, without much ado, I would say the floor is yours, Pilar, and as of now you're in full control. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, as I say, as uh, uh, Albert just said, uh, this is the first of four talks. Uh, I will be giving the first and the fourth talk. Uh, and the plan of this uh, lecture today uh, is the following. I will start with some uh, introduction highlighting the landmarks set by neutrinos in the construction of the standard model. Then I will, uh, uh, sorry, oops. I will explain uh, how neutrinos have forced us to actually step out of the standard model in accommodating their tiny masses. And then I will describe in the last part of the talk the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations from which we have learned most of what we know about neutrino masses. So neutrinos are the most elusive particles in this colorful puzzle, which is the standard model. And nevertheless, they have been a key in the discovery not only of the weak interactions, but also in establishing the two most intriguing features of this model, which, are the, uh, which we don't really understand in depth, which are the threefold repetition or family structure and the chiral nature of the weak interactions. So let me go back to the beginning. As uh, you know, the neutrino appeared in the history of physics as a dark phantom particle with the discovery of radioactivity decay in which a nuclei uh, undergoes a transition emitting apparently just an electron, which by energy conservation should have an energy uh, fixed by the uh, uh, rest mass difference of the mother and daughter nuclei. However, when this uh, spectrum was measured, a continuum curve was found ending at this Q, Q value. And it took many years actually, uh, and uh, a great physicist like Wolfgang Pauli to come up with a, what he called a desperate remedy to save uh, energy conservation. In his famous uh, radioactive letter, he proposed that uh, another invisible particle was being emitted together with the electron and therefore share the available energy. Now, after some trials, the, this particle was finally uh, baptized with an Italian name, neutrino. And this was in honor of Enrico Fermi, who was uh, among the first physicists to actually take seriously this uh, Pauli's hypothesis and actually build a theory out of it, which is the famous theory of beta decay. Now, beta decay goes by through a four fermion interaction of this form, which would also imply that neutrinos should interact with matter to some, at some level. Now, it's uh, interesting to recall that the Nature Journal did not publish this article on the basis that it contained speculations too remote from reality to be of interest to the reader. Those were the good old times where papers had to be of interest to readers. And uh, Bitte and Pierce actually estimated from this uh, Fermi theory what would be the uh, neutrino cross-section, and they found this extremely tiny number, uh, declaring that there was no practically possible way of detecting a neutrino. In fact, uh, it's quite challenging to stop a neutrino. The uh, um, uh, length of a neutrino in water would be in the order of a thousand light years. So not surprisingly, Pauli was quite ashamed of what he had done, his postulate, that uh, this theory might be of the sort that he hated, not even wrong. 
However, revealing Pauli's dark matter was just a question of time and ingenuity of many physicists, as uh, you will hear in, this, in these lectures, particularly on the experimental uh, side. And in fact, you can beat any small cross-section by just uh, statistics, so you need a large detector with a large detector of about 1,000 kilograms and a high-intense uh, flux of about uh, 10 to 11 neutrinos per centimeter square per second, you might get a few events per day. And such uh, very intense neutrino sources already had been invented. There was the nuclear reactors, which a typical uh, reactor would produce about 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second isotropically. So if you open your hand at 100 meters from a reactor, you will be receiving about uh, 10 to the 11 neutrinos per second. And this is precisely how the neutrino was first uh, discovered in the famous experiment by Ryan S. and Cohen, who uh, used the reactor at Savannah River to discover the antineutrino by noticing that um, an antineutrino could uh, give a real, really golden signal that we will uh, be discussed tomorrow by, by Stefania. Now, this was such a great idea that modern versions of this Rhinus and Cohen experiment are still making discoveries today. They go under the name of Shaw, Double Shaw, Diabe, Rhino. They are all modern versions of this very uh, famous experiment. Now, as soon as neutrinos were first discovered, it was soon realized that they came in flavors. Uh, the muon had been discovered quite early in, uh, in cosmic rays, but it took some time to understand what this beast was, and that in particular it was a heavy version of the electron and not the nuclear agent, the pion. And uh, it was then realized that this uh, process would take place uh, and produce a phantom particle just like beta decay. Now, it was uh, thought that this neutrino could be different to that in beta decay, and in fact this is what another of the famous experiments in this field did, Lederman, Schwartz, and Steinberger, they uh, created the first, what we call today, accelerator neutrino beam by mimicking what happens in cosmic rays. They hit a proton beam on a target, producing lots of pions that decay to neutrinos, and they put a detector heavily shielded um, from where the signal of this phantom particle from pion decay would be the appearance from time to time of a muon and not an electron, okay? So they clearly established a family uh, identity as a basic property of the standard model. Again, this was such a great idea that modern versions of Lederman, Schwartz, and Steinberger experiments are what we call accelerator neutrino experiments. They are still making discoveries today, today as you will hear in the following talks, and they go under names such as Minos, Opera, T2K, Nova, etc. Now, since uh, all these, uh, I mean, in all these beautiful experiments, of course, people search for kinematical effects of, of the neutrino mass, and the way in which the neutrino mass, uh, a finite neutrino mass, could affect uh, this, uh, the spectrum of beta decay, of the electron in beta decay, would be by modifying slightly the endpoint spectrum, because now the available, uh, maximum available energy for the electron will not be the Q value, but the Q value minus the rest mass of the neutrino. Now, looking for such effect has uh, uh, one, I mean, people have, uh, well, experiments like Mainz and Troisk have been able to put, uh, to set the strongest constraint on the neutrino mass uh, in, uh, that appears in um, combination with an electron. Uh, poorer limits come from uh, similar processes involving muons and taus. So this is why, uh, in the standard model, neutrinos were first assumed to be massless. Okay? Now, uh, with the uh, solved puzzle of the standard model summarized in this table, neutrinos fit nicely as the upper components of the lepton doublets, and they are connected, as I said at the beginning, to two of the most uh, striking features of this table. Uh, the first of these uh, features is the left-right asymmetry, which is nowhere more clear that, than uh, with neutrinos that only have no counterpart on the right. So what does this left-right uh, asymmetry mean? So particles on the left are uh, left-handed projectors, uh, chiral uh, uh, states, which in the 
relativistic limit is the same thing as saying that they are uh, uh, left-handed uh, elicity particles, while the particles on the right are right-handed chirality states, which are uh, positive elit elicity particles. And now the uh, amazing uh, feature of the standard model is that these uh, two, two uh, left and right particles carry different charges under SU2 and U1. But we, beyond that, uh, all particles in the standard model except neutrinos have counterparts on the left and on the right. And this is only uh, neutrinos that only appear on the left. What this means uh, in more formal terms is that they are by fermions, so they are described by a field, uh, a spinor field, which, with two components that describes a massless uh, particle with negative helicity and an uh, antiparticle with positive helicity. And this is the minimum, uh, this is the minimum uh, uh, dimensional representation for a spin one-half relativistic particle, which, however, violates in a uh, extreme way parity and charge conjugation. Instead, all the other fermions in the standard model fall in Dirac uh, 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 representations, with, uh, which are four component spin or representations, which represent the spin one half particles, but also a, can accommodate parity. Okay? Oops. Now, the second striking feature of the, of the standard model table I just show is the family replication. And, uh, of course, as you know very well, neutrinos have been essential in establishing that the standard model has three families. This is because neutrinos are massless, assumed to be massless in the standard model, and therefore the set boson can decay uh, to any uh, pair of neutrinos, no matter uh, how many families there are, and in fact, measuring the visible width of the set zero, one can, uh, which is proportional to this number of, of families, uh, uh, one can actually uh, pin down the num this number to be uh, three with a great precision. Here is the uh, legacy, one of the most important legacy uh, plots from, from CERN uh, in the lab era uh, with uh, this invisible width uh, measurement for the set zero. So, yes, the standard, so I think, I hope I have convinced you that neutrinos have been instrumental in constructing the standard model, but also they have already taught us the way out of the standard model. And this has been thanks to the fact that in spite of their weak interactions, we are surrounded by very intense source of neutrinos that we have detected one after the next. Um, so if you open your hand, uh, you will be receiving about 10 to the 12 neutrinos per second from the sun. The atmosphere at a very different energy range is also a source of neutrinos. You will be receiving about 20 per second. The Earth, natural radioactivity, is an intense source of neutrinos, about 10 to the 9 per second. We have also detected neutrinos coming from very far away, and the famous supernova 87, produced a flux of neutrinos that is uh, comparable to that of, of the sun. Uh, however, the star, the supernova, was 10 to the 8 uh, times farther away from Earth than our sun, which is um, quite amazing. Uh, this, uh, uh, the Big Bang, uh, as we know, left behind this relic uh, cosmic micro background of photons. Well, there is a similar uh, background of neutrinos, However, this has uh, is uh, quite a lot of them. There are quite a lot of them out there. Unfortunately, the energies of these neutrinos are very, very small, and it's very, it's very challenging to detect them, and hasn't been achieved yet. We have even uh, heard uh, from neutrinos from still unknown sources. So, uh, the Ice Cube detector has uh, uh, intercepted. A uh, few beasts of PEV energies, uh, which come from somewhere outside the um, atmosphere, and uh, at present the origin of these uh, very high energy events is a mystery. So using, as I said, this many, uh, many of these natural sources and others that have been made by, uh, in the laboratory, uh, at least two decades of revolutionary neutrino experiments have demonstrated that neutrinos are not quite the standard as we thought. 
because they have a tiny mass, and this implies that we have to extend in one way or another the standard model. And you will be hearing much more about all these beautiful experiments in the following uh, lectures by Stefania. So let's uh, see how we can uh, extend the standard model to uh, have massive neutrinos. For that, uh, let me remind you what is the mass uh, for a Dirac fermion. So a, Dirac, uh, uh, a mass for a Dirac fermion is simply a term in the Lagrangian of this form, which if we write it down in terms of left and right components, we see that it links left and right. So uh, uh, the mass can be seen as, a, a, as a, this, the strength of the transition from left to right. Okay? Now, this we cannot do in the standard model as it stands because there are no right-handed partners for the neutrino. However, it was Majorana that first realized that actually you can do the same even if you have at your disposal just left-handed states. This is what we call a Majorana fermion, and it amounts to adding to the Lagrangian a term of this form, where Psi C is the charge conjugated field, which is a transformation that essentially takes you from particles to antiparticles in a very simplistic uh, uh, way. So the mass in this context can be seen as, a, as a, uh, again, as a um, um, uh, strength of the transition from left to right, but now right is not an independent field, like for the Dirac fermion, but is the antiparticle of the original field. Okay? So a propagating Majorana neutrino is therefore said often to, to be its own antiparticle. Okay? It can go from being a particle state to an antiparticle state just by having a mass. Okay? Now, we can not do none of this. This is not allowed by the sacred uh, principle of gauge invariance in the standard model, and it cannot be done for any of the fermions in the standard model. We cannot give fermions a Dirac mass because, as we have seen, left and right states have different charges under SU2 cross U1 uh, gauge group. Uh, and similarly, for a Majorana fermion that ch changes a particle to its antiparticle, obviously uh, no charge whatsoever, whether it says U2 cross U1 nor any other global charge can be conserved by this uh, interaction. Uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, however, can help us here, and as we know very well, it allows us to give Dirac masses to all the fermions in the standard model, and in the case of neutrinos, it allows us to do either of these two, um, take any of these two ways and, and, and get, give neutrinos a mass. So we can give neutrinos a mass by simply extending the standard model with right-handed neutrinos so that we can write a Yukawa coupling uh, like we do for the remaining fermions. Now this Yukawa coupling connects left and right via Higgs, which matches the charges so that this is gauge invariant. And upon spontaneous symmetry breaking, it takes a expectation value V, and therefore the uh, mass of the fermion is proportional to the Yukawa coupling in front of this operator times the BEF of the Higgs. However, if we don't want to add right-handed neutrinos to the standard model, we can still do that. Uh, uh, we can write down a term that upon spontaneous symmetry breaking would give us a Majorana mass, and we can do this in a gauge invariant way. The term, however, is more complicated. It requires two lepton doublets and two Higgs fields to make it gauge invariant. And therefore, when this Higgs field takes an expectation value, we know that the, uh, uh, it, I mean, it really, this operator turns into the neutrino Majorana mass, However, it's proportional to a second power of the BEF of the Higgs in contrast with the previous situation. Uh, this is also proportional to this coupling here, alpha, which by dimensions must have dimensions of energy to the minus one. So we can write it as, in, uh, as a, a dimensional coupling over some high energy scale that we don't know and could be related or not to the electroweak scale. Now, what is the meaning of this scale? The meaning of this scale is that we know this cannot be the whole story, much, much like uh, Fermi uh, theory of the weak interaction could not be the whole story. Uh, at some scale lambda, we expect 
that new particles will show up that will induce uh, this interaction at low energies. Now, the fact that this uh, neutrino mass is inversely proportional to a new scale is what is often referred to as the CISO mechanism. Uh, the, the higher we make this uh, new scale, uh, the lower naturally the neutrino mass will be. And this is, of course, very interesting because we see a pattern in which neutrino masses, even if they are massive, their masses are uh, really much smaller than the remaining fermions, so this could give us a natural way of understanding this gap. Okay? Now, whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana, their effects, uh, uh, the most important uh, implication of neutrino masses, which is lepton mixing, is very similar to both, uh, to both cases. Essentially, what I just said is that neutrino masses, in the case of Dirac, in the case of, uh, of the Dirac option, uh, the uh, old fermion masses could be proportional to the BEF of the Higgs with some Yukawa coupling uh, that is, in principle, a generic matrix in a family space. So it can link families. Okay? Now, this means that if we write down uh, the mass matrix for neutrinos and the, uh, and the leptons and the charged leptons, we find that these two matrices are generic matrix, complex matrices that can be taken to the diagonal form, uh, so this is what we call going to the mass eigenbases, by uh, performing some unitary rotations on the left and on the right, which are independent. Now, if we go to that basis, so we we, we move, uh, we change bases so that now these masses are diagonal, then we find that all these uh, unitary rotations disappear from everywhere except from the charge current interaction, uh, uh, which uh, where, uh, uh, in general, a uh, unitary matrix remains, which is, of course, the complete analogous to the CKM matrix in the quark sector. And in this Dirac case, the analogy is basically exact. This matrix will depend on three angles and one CP violating phase. And you will see tomorrow how much we know about uh, this uh, matrix. Now, if we are in the Majorana case, uh, the situation is quite similar. We have a Majorana mass instead of right-handed neutrinos now. But no matter what, this matrix is a completely generic matrix in family space. It can be uh, taken to a diagonal form by a unitary transformation of this form. And again, a PMNS matrix appears in the, weak, in the charge current uh, uh, interaction. The only difference between the Majorana and the Dirac case is that now we cannot re redefine or reabsorb as some physical uh, as many as the CP phases that we could in the case of Dirac. So the three physical CP phases in general remain in this matrix. Okay? And this will come up later on. So neutrino mixing, uh, when, when we produce a, charge current intera a neutrino in a charge current interaction, we produce it always in, uh, in connection with an electron, a muon, or a tau. Okay? So this is what we call a flavor eigenstate. Okay? And this is not the same as the mass eigenstate. They are related by this unitary uh, matrix, which uh, is usually parameterized uh, in a Euler uh, type fashion in this way, uh, where these extra phases, so this would be up to here, this would be the uh, same parameterization of the CKM, and there is uh, some extra phases that can be parameterized in this uh, fashion. Now, clearly, if we want to distinguish these two possibilities, Dirac and Majorana, which have very important implications for our understanding of the standard model, as we will see in the, in the last lecture, uh, uh, we would like to, to actually distinguish these two possibilities. It's a very, one of the most important questions in neutrino physics. Now, in principle, the, the, uh, deciding whether you have a Majorana or Dirac uh, would give very clear experimental signatures. Ima imagine you create a neutrino beam from pi plus decay. Now, if neutrinos are Dirac, uh, when they interact in the detector, they will only produce mu minuses. However, if they are Majorana, they can produce mu minuses as well, but then from time to time, quite rarely, they can produce a wrong sign muon. Now, 
This is, of course, a very clear signal. The problem is that these processes in which the, you get the wrong sign uh, are extremely rare, and this is because uh, it requires a, a chirality transition which is proportional to the mass of the neutrino. And therefore, the rate for the right sign uh, with respect to the rate of the wrong sign is suppressed with a ratio mass of neutrino over energy squared, and this is completely generic. Okay? So the, first, uh, the best uh, hope you have is to have as small energy as possible, and the best hope we think at the moment to discover um, uh, this Majorana uh, nature of neutrinos is through neutrinoless double beta decay. Now, some isotopes cannot undergo a single beta decay, but they can undergo a double beta decay. So the usual process uh, would go through the production of two neutrinos in the final state. Now, this process has been measured for several isotopes in the range of 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 21 uh, years of lifetime. Uh, however, if neutrinos are Majorana, the neutrino producing one of these uh, decays can be absorbed by the other because it can turn it into its antiparticle. And uh, then you can have the process, but without neutrinos in the final state. This is what we call neutrinoless double beta decay. And uh, as I said before, the process compared to the uh, standard one would be suppressed with a neutrino mass over energy squared. In this case, however, you gain a lot in phase space from uh, comparing these two processes. So uh, the situation is as, as optimal as it gets. Okay. Now, this process has been searched for in several isotopes, and here is a, a, a summary table. Uh, essentially, the lifetime can be computed as a, some phase space factor, which is uh, something calculable, a nuclear matrix element that is very, very hard to, to, um, to compute, and then what we are interested in, which is this neutrino mass and a combination of neutrino masses and mixings. Now, uh, the top runners right now in the field are the experiments Gerda uh, that uses germanium and uh, uh, EXO and Kam Lam Sen that uses xenon. In particular, Kam Lam Sen has, uh, been, uh, has done an enormous uh, effort to, uh, and they, have, or, or they also had a, few, a bit of luck, to get this uh, very, very uh, uh, good limit of the, uh, this combination which, depending on the nuclear matrix elements that are assumed, would be between 0.06 electron volt and 0.16 electron volt. And I will come back to that in the last, in the last talk. So let me now turn to the uh, uh, last topic I want to discuss in this lecture, which is uh, the phenomena of neutrino oscillations. Now, as we have said, the fact that neutrinos are massive implies generically that whatever we produce in uh, combination with an electron, muon, and tau in a charge current interaction is a combination of the mass eigenstates. This makes any neutrino experiment that produces a neutrino via charge current interaction and detects it via charge current interaction an interferometer in flavor space because neutrinos are so weakly interacting that uh, the nice uh, counterpart of uh, this uh, difficulty is that they can keep coherence over very long distances. So, if you produce a neutrino in flavor alpha, you are producing really a coherent combination of these mass eigenstates, which are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in vacuum, and therefore they evolve uh, picking up phases, different phases. So at some distance uh, away, uh, which we usually call the baseline L, it, there is some non-zero probability that the state uh, uh, can be seen as a different flavor. Okay? This is the uh, probability of oscillation, the general form, uh, master formula for the oscillation probability from a neutrino alpha to a neutrino beta, uh, where uh, you can see it is a superposition of sinusoidal uh, um, of oscillatory functions with wavelengths that are uh, fixed by uh, the neutrino mass square differences and amplitudes that depend on co different combinations of the elements of the mixing matrix. Now, there are many ways to derive this oscillation probability master formula. Uh, in order of difficulty, one could uh, consider neutrinos as plane waves and just uh, do simple quantum mechanics. Uh, this is 
the derivation you essentially see in all most textbooks. Uh, you can do a bit uh, more work and uh, consider neutrinos as wave packets and again do it in quantum mechanics. You can even go to quantum field theory and not talk at all about whether neutrinos are uh, in this state or another. They are just simply intermediate states. Now, of course, the result of uh, these different derivations is fortunately the same. The uh, difference between these derivations is whether they make more or less explicit the two basic ingredients that you need to have uh, a neutrino oscillations. And therefore, they are more or less susceptible to the usual quantum paradoxes. So the two basic ingredients to get neutrino oscillations is that you need some uncertainty in momentum, both at production and detection. This means that uh, you, must not, you must have a, a, a situation where you cannot kinematically distinguish neutrinos, the, the different mass ion states, because if that's the case, then they cannot be coherently produced. Okay? The second uh, requirement is that, uh, of course, these neutrinos are evolving in time. At some point, it is uh, uh, clear that they will lose coherence. Okay? So, uh, again, when coherence is lost, there cannot be um, uh, oscillations anymore. So, I will just uh, go very quickly through the first derivation, which is the standard textbook derivation, and I will say a few words about the second one to uh, uh, show you how these two ingredients become explicit in this uh, second derivation. So, um, so, as I said, uh, you, you have an experiment in which you have uh, a source of neutrinos that produce some flavor alpha. And this flavor alpha, as we just said, is a combination through the PMNS matrix of the mass ion states that here we assume to have uh, uh, some common momentum P. Now, these states are ion states of the, of the three Hamiltonian with uh, uh, ion values given by the energies, which, uh, of course, uh, these particles are on shells, so they satisfy the relativistic relation. And, of course, the Hamiltonian is what determines the time evolution of these states. Uh, each of these states just picks up a phase, uh, which is e to the minus uh, the energy of that state times the delta t. Now, we want to compute what is the probability that this new state is in a different flavor beta. So, we write a state new beta, which is just the same as this one, but with alpha substituted by beta. And the probability is nothing but the uh, scalar product of these two states squared. Now, if you do that, and then you do a, a relativistic approximation, so uh, these neutrinos are ultra-relativistic, their masses are much smaller than their energies, and therefore, you can expand this uh, energy difference uh, to leading order in the mass uh, of these uh, two states. And you can also assume they move at the uh, velocity of light so that you can exchange time by the distance, because this is how we usually do these oscillation experiments. And there you get the uh, master formula. There is obviously some... Uh, uh, well-founded criticism to this derivation, which often is the source of all these quantum paradoxes that uh, um, people have discussed uh, since a long time. Now, why did I choose the, choose the same momentum for all the mass ion states? Why did I choose plane waves? If I'm talking about neutrinos that are produced here and detected there, and therefore they are localized, they cannot be, uh, strictly speaking, plane waves, why do I have to do this... Um, an aesthetical T to L conversion. So um, it turns out that all these questions can be solved by uh, slightly more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, analysis in which you consider neutrinos as wave packets. Okay? So uh, I will just sketch uh, um, uh, the, the way to do this, but I will not go through all the algebra, of course. You can check the transparencies if you're interested. So here, uh, again, we have a neutrino of flavor alpha that has been produced at some time zero and at some position x zero. And this is a superposition of mass ion states which are no longer plane waves because to ensure this localization in space-time, uh, you need it to be some kind of wave packet. So uh, you can have a wave packet for each of these mass 
um, uh, state, massive uh, states, which uh, in general will be characterized, for example, if you have some Gaussian wave packet by some uh, average momentum of the wave packet and some uh, momentum uncertainty, which is of course related to uh, in an inversely proportional way to the space uh, uh, um, width of, of this wave packet. Now, the, the state at the detector, the state that is detected, is again a wave packet. Now, the detection time and position is different, it's T and L. And therefore, we essentially write exactly the same thing with a wave packet that now, in principle, uh, might be different because it depends on uh, uh, the way in which we will detect uh, these uh, neutrinos. Now, as I say, I will spare you with, uh, with the algebra, but if you uh, assume um, uh, Gaussian wave packets, you can go quite far in uh, uh, having analytical expressions. And finally, what you do is, uh, so essentially, in order to compute the amplitude for this process, you just take, again, the scalar product. Uh, the probability will be the square of that, of that amplitude, and then you integrate over time, because time, the time difference between uh, production and detection is not a measured quantity. Okay? Now, if you do that, you end up with, again, something looking like the master formula, but with two important differences, which are these two modulation factors. Okay? One of them uh, ensures that if the baseline is uh, too long compared to this uh, 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 quantity, which I call L coherence, then uh, the uh, uh, oscillations will be sp essentially exponentially suppressed. Now, what is, is this L coherence? Well, this has a very nice, uh, I mean, of course, you can do the algebra and you get some expression, but the physical uh, interpretation of this quantity is simply that this, the minimum distance at which uh, the, uh, the wave packets have traveled such that their positions are separated away by one uh, sigma, okay? And therefore, at that point, coherence can no longer hold and oscillations are suppressed. So this is the coherence uh, requirement. And there is another modulation factor which uh, says that if you have too small, uh, so if your uncertainty in uh, uh, momentum is too good, okay, then at some point you will be able to see um, to, to detect the kinematical effects of the mass of the different mass eigenstates. states. Okay? In this case, when, when this happens, this factor again uh, is an exponential suppression factor that will kill any oscillation term. So this is a much nicer um, uh, result. Unfortunately, in all this uh, uh, process, we have lost the normalization. So I no longer have an equal sign here because it's essentially impossible with this, uh, um, or extremely difficult to, to get right the normalization in this way, okay? Uh, so the, the, the way to handle that is, of course, you know, uh, unitarity must hold, so the uh, uh, oscillation probability from a neutrino alpha to beta uh, should add up to one if, I, if you sum over all final flavors, and this is how you impose then that the result actually should be this one without any prefactor. Now, you can do better than that and not require this unitarity. Uh, and this, uh, for that, you need to go to quantum field theory, but I will not uh, cover this because of lack of time. So, uh, I hope I, I try to pass the message that this is a robust formula, has been tested in many different ways. And uh, I think seeing any deviation for such, from such uh, situation would be extremely difficult and uh, um, very uh, dependent on the specific conditions. So uh, very hard to, to go beyond that. So what is the, uh, so what, uh, when we talk about oscillation probabilities, we might have uh, either a different flavor in the initial and final state. This is what we call an appearance probability or it's the same, and in this case we call it a disappearance or survival probability. Uh, one, another way to write this formula by using the unitarity of this matrix is written here, and I just want to show you this because uh, in, in this way of writing it, you see that there is a term in the oscillation probability 
which it depends on imaginary part of some combination of mixing matrices, uh, uh, of the mixing matrix elements. Okay? This means that there is a sensitivity in the oscillation probability to complex entries in the matrix, uh, which are basically the CP phases. And in fact, if we had computed the oscillation probability for antineutrinos instead of neutrinos, we would have found that this term changes sign. So this means that neutrino oscillations uh, can be sensitive to uh, CP violation, and a way to enhance this is by looking at the comp uh, comparing the oscillation probabilities for neutrinos and antineutrinos, as you will see uh, much more tomorrow. Now, of course, uh, you have, you, uh, probably you have not seen this formula very much if you are not working in neutrino physics. What the formula you have seen most probably is the one uh, corresponding to two neutrinos, in which case uh, it's much simpler because there is only one complex, uh, well, sorry, one ang mixing angle and one delta m square. So this is the appearance probability, and one minus that is the disappearance probability. As a function of the baseline, this is the, how the probability looks like. It's a, a periodic function with a period which is correlated with the uh, bar square differences and an amplitude that is correlated with the mixing angle. Okay? Um, now, normally, neutrino oscillation experiments do not change, or very few of them have a, a change in the baseline, because you have to separate the source from the detector, and this is difficult, certainly not in laboratory experiments. So usually, uh, however, uh, it is quite usual that uh, uh, neutrino experiments involve some continuous uh, spectrum in energy, and therefore, one can uh, compute the oscillation probability as a function of energy, and this same formula gives this curve, where the first, uh, this first maximum, again, gives you information, the position in energy of this maximum gives you information on delta m square, and again, the amplitude is related to the mixing angle. Now, it's clear that if you want to do an experiment that uh, tries to pin down both the mass square difference and the mixing angle, you need to tune your experiment with an energy, neutrino energy and baseline such that this condition holds. Because if you go to much larger values, this means that the oscillation, uh, the os uh, oscillation phase is suppressed. So if you expand on it, you find that you can no longer separate the two parameters, theta and delta m square. You have essentially a degeneracy. Uh, if you go to the other limit, to the fast oscillation regime, uh, essentially what happens is that the oscillations are too fast and you can no longer resolve them. So what you measure is some kind of average. And the average of this oscillation probability is just one half of sine squared to theta, uh, which means that you lose completely all sensitivity to delta m squared. Now, this fast oscillation regime is actually exactly equivalent to uh, propagation without coherence, okay? Uh, so uh, so what, what this means is that the oscillation formula has been built that it has to get to the right limit when coherence is lost, okay? So this fast oscillation regime is equivalent to loss of coherence. Okay, so as you will hear tomorrow, uh, uh, two distinct frequencies have been precisely measured. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, which correspond to the smaller delta m square, has been measured using reactor neutrinos shooting at 100 uh, kilometer distances. Uh, while the other one, the other, so this would be a delta m square of about 10 to the minus 4 electron volt square, and a much larger one, uh, delta m square of about 2.5 10 to the minus 3 electron volt, has been measured both using accelerator neutrinos. Uh, shooting at distances of 1,000 kilometers uh, for energies in the GeV, and also reactor neutrinos, which are MeV energies, shooting much shorter than in this case. Okay. Now, before going to how you would interpret these three neutrino oscillations in this master formula, let me uh, turn to a, an important uh, topic, which is that many neutrino experiments, uh, what I just mentioned, refer to neutrinos propagating in vacuum. Okay? 
However, many neutrino experiments involve neutrinos propagating in matter. For example, uh, 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 accelerator neutrinos usually have neutrinos crossing the Earth uh, uh, crust. Uh, atmospheric neutrinos come, uh, can cross the Earth uh, in, many, in many ways, depending on the zenith angle. Uh, solar neutrinos are produced close to the center of the sun. They have to exit the sun, uh, so they propagate in a very dense environment of, of the sun. And it turns out that neutrinos uh, propagating in matter, uh, which is form of electrons, protons, and neutrons, gets an index of refraction due to coherent forward scattering that can strongly affect the oscillation probability. And the most important uh, uh, effect there is coming from this diagram, the charged current diagram, because the neutral current will just shift all the flavors in the same way, so it will not affect oscillations, uh, at least in this uh, standard scenario. However, the charged currents uh, select the electron, uh, the neutrino electron over the others. And the most important quantity for the size of this effect is the, den the number density of the electrons in the matter that neutrinos are crossing. Now, what uh, you can show that actually the fact that neutrinos cross matter modify the dispersion relation. The relation between energy and momentum is no longer the mass as we used to derive all the oscillation formula. But now uh, it, con it gets a term coming from this matter potential which actually has a different sign for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And this is because matter is, of course, not CP invariant. It's made of matter and not antimatter. Now, uh, what this amounts to is that, in fact, the oscillation probabilities that I wrote can still be applied to this case. However, now the mixing angles and masses are effective ones. They come from the diagonalization of this combination and not just the uh, bare mass matrix. And uh, uh, so, the, in general, they will be dependent not only on the vacuum parameters, but also on these matter potentials and the neutrino energy sitting here. So, for the case of two families, this is relatively easy to work out. And what you find is that the mixing angle for neutrinos crossing some matter density with a constant density given by this number density of electrons, uh, the, uh, there is a condition this, uh, well, if this holds, if this condition holds, which involves some combination of the masses and, and mixings and this density uh, of electrons and the energy, then uh, this term here disappears. It can only, of course, hold for one of the signs, but for one of the signs, if it holds, then it doesn't hold for the other. But for the one that holds, this becomes zero, and then you can see that the mixing angle, these two terms cancel, and you just get one no matter what the vacuum mixing angle is, okay? Now, this is, of course, understood in terms of the famous MSW resonance. So, imagine you would have, the, your mixing angle would be exactly zero, okay? So, then the mass eigenstates states uh, in matter, as a function of the matter uh, electron uh, number density, will look like this for either neutrinos or antineutrinos. Okay, so you would have a, a complete a global shift of both mass eigenstates by the matter density, but then the electrons, because of the charge current uh, coherent scattering, will get an extra uh, contribution. And then at some point, these levels might cross. Okay, now if you have a, a small mixing angle, no matter how small, of course, we know that physically this never happens, there is no uh, uh, level crossings, but instead there is a resonance, okay? So the uh, heavier state that for zero matter density is mostly the muon for a small mixing angle in vacuum, when you go to very large matter densities, it's mostly an electron because this is this state here, okay? And the other way around, okay? Now the position of this closed, uh, um, uh, closest uh, point is precisely the resonant condition. As I already mentioned, it will hold for neutrinos or antineutrinos, but not for both. And it will depend on the sign of this combination, whether it's for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And as you will see, uh, this is one of the handles we have to actually uh, pin down one of the unknowns uh, in neutrino physics presently, which is the hierarchy in which uh, the uh, mass eigenstates are ordered. Now, um, 
This MSW effect is, however, very essential in understanding or interpreted solar neutrinos. Solar neutrinos uh, don't move in constant matter. Uh, the uh, number density of electrons in the sun is, uh, very, is highest at uh, the center of the sun, and then it decreases exponentially uh, as we go towards the, uh, the, um, the, the radius, I mean, the, we exit the sun. So, now, if you have a, this kind of situation, then you can compute uh, the uh, instantaneous mass agent states as a function of radius, okay? So, uh, of course, as a function of radius, if we are in the center of the sun, we, ha we have a very large density, we are here, and then as we decrease uh, this uh, density as we exit the sun, uh, the instantaneous mass agent states are changing. Now, if this variation is slow enough, and it is in the sun, for the parameters uh, we know, then it is a good approximation to uh, the so-called adiabatic approximation is a very good one, which says that if a state is in a mass agent state at some uh, given uh, radius, then it will remain, it will exit the sun in the same agent state. It will not jump, okay? So the, uh, the probability that a neutrino electron produced in the sun will remain a neutrino electron is easily then computed from the probability that the neutrino, uh, that in the center of the sun is in a, a neutrino electron is in a given mass agent state, and then the times the probability that this mass agent state in the, uh, when the, uh, you exit the sun is a neutrino electron and sum incoherently over all the states. So there is no oscillations here, okay? There is no coherence, no oscillations here. However, what happens uh, here is the following. Now, as I say, uh, imagine that you, have a, uh, you start with, uh, in the center of the sun with a density which is above resonance. So you are at, uh, somewhere here. Now, if you produce a neutrino electron, this neutrino electron is mostly the heaviest guy, okay? But if, if the adiabatic approximation is good and you are there, then you will exit the sun being mostly a muon. Okay? So the oscillation probability, uh, the survival probability for a neutrino electron in these conditions is basically, the, uh, you can actually compute it and you find that this is actually the vacuum angle square, uh, sign of the vacuum angle square. So the smaller the angle, the most uh, uh, um, clean this trans the electron muon transition uh, is. Now, if the density in the center of the sun is, however, below resonance, then a neutrino electron is mostly the lightest state and it will remain so as, as you exit the sun. Now, what is the electron density? Are we above or below resonance? Well, this is a, a question that depends on the energy of the neutrino. It's not just uh, depending on the, uh, uh, the density of the sun, but it also depends on the energy of the neutrino because of this condition. You can see there is an energy here. And now the solar neutrinos have a spectrum, as you will see tomorrow, that encompasses several uh, orders of magnitude in energy. And it turns out that uh, if you, you have uh, neutrinos coming from the sun that are uh, energetic enough to be above resonance and some that are uh, below resonance, okay? So for those experiments that detect the higher neutrinos, you would expect to find a survival probability, which is basically this, the sine squared theta, uh, of the uh, vacuum, well, if, if you are below resonance, the oscillation probability is the one in vacuum uh, very approximately, okay? So, you don't have information on delta m squared by looking only here or here, but of course you have uh, information on the delta m squared by knowing where this step happens, okay? So, this is how solar neutrinos get a, uh, information on delta m squared. So, here is what you have measured uh, over many years by uh, these uh, solar neutrino experiments. So it's the survival probability as a function of energy. And uh, as you can see, there are experiments that are measuring the higher uh, energy uh, range. And therefore, from them, we can essentially read from this curve what is the vacuum angle relevant for uh, these oscillations in the sun. Okay? So in the last five minutes, I will just, uh, all what I've talked about here essentially are, uh, I've talked about neutrinos of two families oscillating, okay? However, we know, as I already mentioned, that two 
Different frequencies have been measured in data using solar and atmospheric uh, experiments and many others, as you will see tomorrow. And therefore, we cannot longer uh, talk about two families because we need at least two distinct mass differences. Okay? So we can assign, uh, in an arbitrary way, uh, the largest delta m squared to uh, uh, the, the, the difference of the two and three states and the uh, smaller one to the one, two states. And this is completely arbitrary. Of course, it's just the labeling of the states. Now, the mixing, of course, involves many mixing angles, not just one. Okay? Now, it turns out that uh, in spite of this complexity, uh, you can see that uh, actually the, uh, the solar and atmospheric oscillations decouple as two by two mixing phenomena quite accurately, provided and because there is a hierarchy in the delta m squares, which is larger than 10, and one of the angles in this matrix turns out to be small. So let's see what, how this happens. Imagine you have an E over L, an experiment with an E over L that tunes to the larger delta m square. Okay? And this delta m square is much larger than the other one. So you can essentially neglect the oscillation terms that go with this uh, frequency, with this longer frequency, and, and uh, remain with the ones that have the uh, significant uh, oscillation frequency. And this is what you find in that case. Okay? So, of course, the, all transitions can take place okay? with the same uh, uh, dependence or sinusoidal dependence on the uh, baseline, but with different combinations of mixing angles in, in, uh, in front. Okay? Now, imagine that besides that, we set one of the angles uh, to zero. Then what happens is that essentially we turn into a two-family scenario. Two of the probabilities are zero because of this angle being zero. Uh, and there is only one that survives and has exactly the same form as if there were only two families. Okay? So this allows us to interpret uh, whatever we measure uh, at leading order in this atmospheric range as coming from these two parameters. Okay? Now, what happens if you now tune your experiment, your E over L, to be uh, at the longer, the, uh, longer wavelength or the smaller delta m square? Then what happens with the largest uh, oscillation is that it gets averaged out. Okay? So if you do that approximation and average out all the fast frequencies, then you find that, the, uh, for example, the survival for probability for neutrino electrons has this form. Now, it only depends, of course, on the delta m square that you are not integrating out. And uh, again, if you take theta 1, 3 uh, of this angle to zero, you recover exactly the 2 by 2 mixing formula again. Okay? So if you do experiments in the solar range at leading order, this is well described by a two-family oscillation where you interpret the two parameters that you measure there uh, uh, or you, you identify the two parameters that you measure there with these two uh, in the full uh, three uh, neutrino mixing uh, scenario. Now, we know now that uh, we, can, uh, we have enough precision, as you will see tomorrow in neutrino experiments, to actually look at these subleading effects, which implies that uh, neutrino mixing and oscillations are really a three-family uh, phenomenon, and you can no longer do approximations such as this to interpret uh, neutrino oscillation data. And you will hear much more tomorrow, and I'm perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you. So is there any question? I just want to comment about wave packet. In more of the practical cases, uh, solar uh, reactors or uh, cases, you have beams of neutrinos. If you have beamness of neutrinos, you cannot distinguish statistical and quantum mechanical uncertainties. So wave packets become completely unnecessary. And, more, and if, you, if you work, continue to work on wave packet language, it's uh, some kind of minefield. You can make many mistakes, so it's better to don't work in uh, 
wave packet approximate wave packet language and just as you wrote. Um, okay. I don't you know if I cannot distinguish statistical uncertainty from the quantum mechanical uncertainty. The wave packet is a quantum mechanical. Yeah, I mean, my, my comment on the wave packet was not of a practical nature. Uh, in all ex neutrino experiments that you can think of, uh, uh, certainly we are extremely far away from, uh, from being sensitive to any of these effects that show up in the wave packet approximation, okay? So it's not a, 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 a question of practical uh, relevance for experiments, it is a question of principle, okay? that uh, if, you know, the usual approximation that you see in most textbooks, which is this plane wave approximation, uh, often leads to quantum paradoxes simply because you are not uh, uh, formulating the, pro the problem properly. And the wave packet provides that formulation, which uh, explicitly makes explicit when oscillations should disappear. However, I agree with you, there is no relevance of this uh, wave packet treatment for real experiments. Uh, I have uh, one question. I'm not sure what measure this is, but so what you would like to have for a good measurement is a very narrow spectrum of neutrinos. Is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, uh, of course, when, when I, when I uh, what is the, I mean, when I, do, I say this, look at this sign. I mean, this ha doesn't have to be exact or, uh, or in any way, okay? It's, it's an order of magnitude uh, statement. You want to be uh, close to this uh, being satisfied if you want to re be sensitive to the frequency uh, that is driven by this delta m square. Uh, now, of course, if you would have a monochromatic neutrino beam, that would have many advantages. I mean, especially if you would be able to tune the energy as you please, uh, because this will, uh, I mean, this will help you in many ways, uh, because usually what we measure in neutrino experiments is, the, is not the neutrino energy, but the lepton energy, and reconstructing the neutrino energy is a very difficult task. So if you would know the energy of your neutrino, life would be very, very much simple, uh, simple in experiments. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, this, is, this should be understood as an order of magnitude estimate, okay? Yeah, I mean, okay, there, there are, um, I mean, most of the beams that, uh, the neutrino beams that have been used in experiments are all of these, uh, you know, conventional, the so-called conventional neutrino beams, which come from pi on decays, and it's very difficult to know the flux and uh, everything from first principles, okay? Uh, now, there are other alternatives to this where you would may, maybe not get a, a monochromatic, a monochromatic, uh, uh, neutrino beam, but at least to know much better what your flux is, okay? And these are these neutrino factory uh, where you get neutrinos from muon decay or these beta beams where you get neutrinos from um, radioactive um, uh, 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 accelerated isotopes. Now, there is also, I think, a proposal for a monochromatic uh, neutrino beam using some uh, beta decay, but uh, I don't know exactly what the status is there. Uh, it's probably quite hard to get the uh, intensities you would need, I would say, but uh, I mean, ideas like that exist, yes. No more questions? Okay, so you will hear much more tomorrow about these beautiful experiments and see you on Friday. Thanks. <laughs>